Good morning and good evening to everybody. We have some exciting topics to be discussed today. For one full hour, we're going to talk about the much talked about or hottest topic right now, which is central bank digital currency. For this morning, we're going to have two distinguished guests who will actually discuss with us and explain to us what CBDC is all about. First of all, I would like to introduce to you our Deputy Governor of the Philippine Central Bank or the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, Deputy Governor Mamerto Tangonan. Welcome, DG. Thank you, Joey. Glad to be here. Thank you. And we also have another distinguished guest. He is the Chief of Worldwide Markets for eCurrency Limited. And this office is based in San Francisco, California. I would like to introduce to you Mr. Miles Young. Good morning, Miles. Good morning, Joey. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this panel. Thank you very much for uh, joining us uh, this morning. And uh, we would like to start with Miles, definitely, to really talk to us exactly what CBDC or Central Bank Digital Currency is all about. So can you please explain it to us in simple terms what this hot topic is all about? Right. Central bank digital currency, right? As the name imply, this is a digital currency issued by the central bank. It is, you can say in a way, a cash, but a cash in a digital form. So it is issued by the central bank under the same legal framework and operational framework that put physical cash in circulation like banknotes or coins. Now, central banks are exploring CBDC to improve the efficiency and resilience of payments, increase accessibility to central bank in the digital economy, uh, support innovations and enable digital inclusion. Uh, on the other hand, there are concerns of the potential negative effects of CBDC, such as the um, disintermediation of existing financial institutions, AML compliance, and privacy protection, uh, settlement finality, and so on. So there have been lots of talk about um, the various ways to design and implement CBDC. Uh, you probably have heard about account-based versus value-based CBDC, centralized versus decentralized systems, uh, direct uh, versus uh, intermediate, intermediated or even indirect distribution, online and offline usage, um, and, and others terms, right, in, in defining CBDC's characteristics. Um, so I have been discussing with central banks on this topic since 2014. Uh, in summary, at a high level, we can design and implement the technology, the technical technological solution that can deliver the desirable benefits and at the same time mitigate the negative effects by meeting the following seven fundamental requirements first. Firstly, CBDC is another form of cash issued by the central bank, as I said earlier. So to be able to issue CBDC with a clear legal status as cash, the sole authority of the central bank in the minting and issuance of CBDC must be clearly enforced by the technology in keeping with the existing currency legal and operational frameworks. The central bank must be able to maintain full control of the CBDC minting issuance systems, which is different and separate from the payment systems and services. Secondly, cash is highly trusted by the public, right? Because it is issued by the central bank and it is protected by many security features account against counterfeits. So similarly, CBDC must be protected from counterfeits, including in the future, quantum computing hacking to maintain the trust of cash in the digital world. 
and to be trusted by the public. Therefore, number three, CBDC must be very reliable. The infrastructure must be available 24 by 7 and can handle large transaction volume, especially for retail users. And number four, people like to use cash because it is simple and easy, right? You don't need to know the person you are transacting with. And you hand over the cash and it is done. So transaction in CBDC must also be easy and can achieve this immediate settlement finality to be adopted by the general public. And number five, cash is the value anchor for other forms of money. But at the same time, cash is a small percentage of money supply. Therefore, CBDC must do no harm in terms of causing financial disintermediation or causing financial instability. Not only that it does no, does no harm, CBDC should leverage the existing financial infrastructure to make it widely accept, accessible and acceptable. And therefore, the six requirements, application, programmability, and innovation should be able to add it and developed by the private sector on top of CBDC. And finally, the central bank should be able to monitor CBDC circulation to take advantage of the information available to make more informed policy decisions uh, to monitor compliance while privacy is preserved according to the relevant laws and regulations. So at the end, it should be the policy, regulation and business objectives and requirements driving the technology, not the other way around. Thank you very much, Miles. It's really very uh, encouraging to, for you to talk about CBDC in terms of efficiency, in terms of security. And you mentioned that since 2014, e-currency has been at the forefront of uh, talking to different central banks, different jurisdictions uh, across the globe. What do you think is the technology behind this to make sure that your seven beneficial aspects of CBDC are actually addressed or taken care of. What is that technology, especially on security and privacy? Right. So um, I think a lot of discussion on technology sides are, are around um, two camps, right? They are called conventional technology versus novel technology, i.e. DLT and blockchain. So I think that what's the important is when we look at the evaluating the technology, we should really start from the requirements, the policy design and the operational requirements when you evaluating these two types of technologies. Um, I am, I'm seeing sometimes in some situations, people are jumping ahead, right? When they're designing the system and design technology, they start with a particular technology in mind. So they are, kind of trying to fit their requirements within the characteristic of that technology. And, 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 and because the technology may be designed for something else, they will have to go back and try to retrofit right, the technology and, and overcome um, the, 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 the challenges that come with the technology. So I think it's important, right? When, uh, when we uh, design and uh, look into technology, we should start with uh, 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 policy uh, requirements, right? the intention of CBDC, and come to the conclusion uh, of the right kind of technology. So, for example, in, in e-currency, um, based on this requirement, right, our colleagues have developed technology for central bank to issue the CBDC, and that can be distributed by banks and non-banks, financial institutions. And to provide this CBDC to the end users, whether it's the businesses or consumers, into their online or offline wallets, uh, CBDC wallets. So that's the route we are taking to, um, to support the central bank to issue CBDC. That's very good, because what you're saying is that you are very much customer driven. You're not using technology as an end in itself but actually to use technology as an enabler for a central bank to implement such a digital uh, solution. Now, I have a question. Since 2014, I understand, 
you've been talking to a lot of these central banks. Have you done any pilots or implementation that is actually live right now? And you could please tell us your experience and what are the different hurdles that you encountered when you were doing this pilot or actual implementation of CBDC? Yeah, um, so eCurrency has, um, well, we, we started um, um, the work in 2011. Right? So we spent a bit of time to really research and understand currency itself. And then we, in that, in that uh, from 2011 to 2014 and so on, we met different central banks. And we started the first pilot, in production pilot in 2014 uh, with a mobile money operator in, in Africa. And now we have, over this course of years, we now have a, a pilot with the Bank of Jamaica in last year, 2021. And then it, uh, the pilot was completed at the end of 2021. Um, Bank of uh, Jamaica now has um, gone through the necessary um, changes to the Central Bank Act to recognize CBDC as a legal tender. That was done in June this year. And then the central bank is now going through a rollout, national rollout process. So um, four, um, four banks has been already slated uh, to, uh, to be onboarded in this uh, rollout schedule. Um, so the CBDC, uh, they're using a model, a digital model that is similar to the one uh, published by BIS, uh, the so-called the hybrid CBDC model. So in that model, central bank is the sole issuer right, of CBDC as empowered by the Central Bank Act. And then the CBDC uh, is issued to the commercial banks, right? And then the commercial bank will provide the CBDC wallet to the end users and distribute the CBDC to the end users. So this is a model uh, very similar to this BIS hybrid CBDC model. So Although the CBDC is distributed through the intermediaries, because the CBDC as a bearer instrument is issued by the central bank, so the holder actually are having a direct claim on the central bank, right? It is not a claim of the liability of the intermediary. It is a direct claim of the central bank. So therefore, they can, when they, when they transfer the CBDC, they arrive at settlement finality immediately. There's no requirement for any subsequent settlement between their service providers, right? Because these are not liabilities sitting in the uh, balance sheet of the intermediaries, right? These are the liabilities of the central banks. So in that way, the payment efficiency is improved. The, um, the, the, the robustness of the payment system, of this payment system is stronger. And uh, it provides a foundation for different innovation, right, to be uh, built on. Now, so the commercial bank and also non-bank providers in the future can offer their own flavors of the wallet, CBDC wallet, with different features that can cater for different customer segments and use cases. So they can have a wallet that is designed for more the uh, sophisticated users um, uh, and linked to the bank accounts. Or they can be designing a wallet that is for more um, people with occasional users or in a more rural areas that has mainly relying on a basic phone, right? Interacting with the CBC, CBDC through USSD, right, for example. That's very good. Now I understand in all your discussion, Miles, it looks like central bank is key here for you to be able to get this implemented uh, with different partners like banks, as you mentioned, and then down to the consumer level. How did you actually address any regulatory issues, especially, let's say, the Bank of Jamaica or the Jamaican government? How did you overcome those hurdles to be able to now implement it, as you said, starting June on a nationwide scale? How did you do that? Right. Well, the Bank of Jamaica actually has spanned um, year or more than a year long time in defining the objective of CBDC. First of all, right? Why, why do we, I mean, a lot of central bank has gone through that um, cycle, right? To understand we really prioritize the benefit of CBDC under the own context of the, of the economic environment, right? And then they will look at the 
relevant laws and regulations that need to be changed in order to enable the issuance of CBDC to make to give the CBDC very clear legal status. So they have done all this work up front. And then they also spend time in talking to the financial industry to listen to their concern, to explain to them the intention and listen to the concerns. It, before, even before they engage the technology vendors, such as eCurrency, right, to look into technologies. Um, I think the I think we have been talking technology so far, right? but actually, as you are going to, lead, uh, you're leading to, the non-technical aspect are even more important in a successful CBDC implementation. Um, I think by choosing, you can say, uh, you can call it a conventional technology if it's not based on blockchain. They were able to spend most of the energy on focusing on these non-technical issues, the regulatory issues, the commercial issues and the public education. I think the public education is a big factor in the success of CBDC implementation. Thank you very much. This is a very good segue, Miles, to our next distinguished speaker, who is the Deputy Governor of the Philippine Central Bank. Deputy Governor, Bert, uh, Miles talked about Central Bank as the key figure here. What do you think is the regulatory environment as a whole, and specifically in the Philippines, that could possibly support implementation of CBDC in, in this country? Well, first of all, the uh, jurisdiction has to have a regulation that gives them the mandate uh, to issue um, um, specifically, or at least it covers uh, uh, a digital uh, currency. Um, in the case of the Philippines, uh, in our charter, what uh, is contemplated there is more of a physical uh, currency. And um, apart from that, um, at least I'm, if I talk about retail CBDC, there may be concerns uh, around it at this time um, in as far as regulations is concerned. But, but um, the story is that the same for wholesale. Uh, CBDCs. Um, give, given our current regulations, uh, at least for for the for the BS for the Banco Central of Philippines or the Central Bank of the Philippines, uh, we don't see any legal or regulatory issues uh, when it comes to issuing wholesale CBDCs. That's very good. So this wholesale part is something that the Central Bank of the Philippines had immediately implement in terms of testing the concept of CBDC. So if that is the case, if there's no hurdle, what exactly is the central bank doing right now as far as the wholesale implementation is concerned? Well, yeah, uh, for that, Joey, uh, I'll, I'll just go back uh, a bit because uh, you know uh, more and more uh, central banks are uh, in various stages of learning and implementing CBDCs. Um, we, uh, recognize the, the need to uh, be familiar and uh, or rather be prepared to, to use this um, emerging technology if necessary. As, uh, as you know, the um, popularity of uh, cryptocurrency has emerged and uh, it's uh, growing and it's uh, uh, filling uh, use cases where otherwise you would use, uh, you know, either physical currency or or um, an electronic representation of it. Um, so, um, if if that trend continues, then it it may present some risks in terms of financial stability and, of course, financial integrity. Um, so. Again, it is very important for, for Central, BSP included, to really be familiar and uh, uh, know as much about uh, this uh, new technology. So that led us to uh, do a study in 2020. Um, and in that assessment, that's where we um, saw the gaps in our regulatory uh, and legal environment. Um, but again, um, even be if, 
even before going to the gaps, if, if we just look at uh, the benefits of uh, CBDC as uh, they are known now, um, it for, for a jurisdiction like the Philippines where we have a, a mature uh, digital payment system um, where all uh, account owners uh, are practically interconnected, um, we we saw uh, uh, marginal benefits uh, for CBDC, but again, the story with wholesale is different. We we see a huge potential uh, for CBDCs in the wholesale uh, uh, large uh, value payments. So um, in twenty twenty one. We did another assessment in order to um, be more certain on which UK's use cases uh, wholesale CBDCs could, could best be used for. And we have identified at least three. And these are um, first for uh, cross-border uh, payments and, and settlements. Um, and this is large value. This is not a retail uh, CBDCs. Um, second is uh, a security settlement um, for equities or uh, um, debt instruments. Um, the other one is uh, uh, liquidity management. Um, so... That led us to launch a pilot this year. Um, it's, it's a pilot for wholesale CBDC, and uh, we are working with, uh, with 11 uh, supervised financial institutions as the, as the pilot um, uh, participants. Um, of course, when this thing get lo- gets, uh, eventually, if and when it gets launched, then it will be open to all uh, uh, supervised institutions by the BSP. Um, and uh, we have, I think, at least around seven uh, other participants who are uh, considered as observers. Mm-hmm. So um, this this is the uh, pilot that we have just launched uh, about uh, a week or two ago. After we... Oh, thank you very much. So... Deputy Governor, this CBDC is no longer in theoretical, uh, just discussing it uh, in terms of uh, just the different uh, benefits, but you're actually, BSP now is actually very much into uh, pilot implementation, as you said, wholesale versus retail. What do you think are going to be the success criteria for BSP to say that this pilot is successful and then we're going now to make it a little bit more nationwide or have more participation from different financial institutions and observers. What do you think those are for BSP to say, okay, we're now actually ready to go ahead and implement this in a more nationwide level? Uh, well, Joe, it has to pass the basic test of, of, uh, of payment systems. Um, it's got to be safe. Uh, it's got to be efficient and reliable. But uh, on top of that, at least for CBDC, um, we we would like it to be re- uh, more resilient, meaning um, we would like to be certain that uh, if and when, uh, let's say, unlike an RTGS, a re- real-time growth settlement system that uh, normally central banks would own and operate, if that goes down, then, then you don't have a... Uh, a settlement uh, uh, going on, and that's, that's definitely um, harmful for for the financial system and the country's economy. Uh, but uh, for for CBDC, if there will be um, uh, distributed uh, uh, copies of the same uh, truth, uh, then. Um, uh, this would serve as reliable records. So even if any of the nodes go down, then it, it, it could be, I mean, uh, you know, the, the records could be reestablished and, and that, that's, that, 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 that would be uh, very helpful for resiliency. And the second one, if um, 
is um, um, we we would like to see it as being um, um, uh, available twenty four seven. Mm-hmm. Um, so, because you know, uh, financial transactions are getting sophisticated, and and um, you know, round the clock uh, transactions are really now, or it has become uncommon, uh, not uncommon. So, um, but you know, in terms of human limitations, uh, you can operate RTGS only during uh, central or banking hours. Oh, yeah. So it is best that uh, if if this proves to be able to uh, 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 enable settlements, uh, even uh, I mean round the clock, twenty four seven, then it, it would have a um, huge value for us. That's very good, and I, I think that you know that the, those success criteria are going to be important because of the fact that uh, this has an impact in terms of the whole financial industry. So remember earlier, uh, Miles mentioned about technology. What was the technology or the background of that technology that made you choose a specific vendor to actually support BSP for this whole wholesale pilot implementation of CBDC? Right. Um, actually, we haven't uh, reached that stage wherein we selected a specific uh, technology, Joey. So, what what um when we when we put out um uh an rfi uh we asked that uh the the system or the product uh should have been either be in use uh in in a production mode in in um other jurisdictions or uh it, it it's um you know uh, been piloted by our uh, uh, international partners, such as uh, the, the Bank for International Settlements or the IMF um, or the other um, partners of, of uh, the central bank um, in order to have some degree of certainty that uh, these are proven to be robust and resilient uh, platforms within which to use for uh, our currency and the payments. Oh, thank you very much. Now, uh, one of the things that actually deter some jurisdiction of implementing the so-called digital currencies and so on is really the number of transactions that the technology can process. And as you know, especially if you go down downstream to uh, retail, uh, the ability of this technology to process thousands and thousands of transactions uh, will be very key in terms of making it successful. Now, the question there is, do you think this will play a role in wholesale or even down to the retail or just on the wholesale level alone? As you mentioned, because the digital payments environment in the Philippines is already, as you mentioned, mature already. So. Do you think this will be a, a big stumbling block for uh, technology providers to be able to address this? Um, that's that's the reason, Joey, why uh, we are more keen on uh, uh, using CBDCs for wholesale because, um, like, uh, we we are doing uh, under ten thousand of uh, wholesale transactions. We are settling about uh, under 10,000 of transactions per day. And I think this is a volume that uh, uh, CB, uh, CBDC platform can can uh, accommodate. For uh, retail, at least for, for the case of the Philippines, where we're talking uh, uh, over 500 million uh, transactions uh, a year. So um, we, we really have to be sure that uh, um, the technology can support such volume if and when we see that there is a benefit really for using uh, CBDCs for retail payments. Okay, we understand that. Now, as you mentioned, there are, I think, uh, digital in payments environment in the Philippines is already mature or has reached a maturity stage. Do you ever think that CBDC will have some impact on 
I understand there are about 60 or more uh, payment providers uh, right now operating in the Philippines. Do you think that will have some sort of an impact on these guys or will they actually coexist together and make, a, as you mentioned, a safe and uh, efficient, reliable digital uh, environment or digital payment environment in the Philippines? Do you think they will actually come head to head in the future or will they coexist? Uh, in, in, in the case of uh, um, uh, the BSP, you know, we, we believe in um, market-based principles. Um, as long as uh, we can ensure that the payment system or the currency is safe and secure um, and uh, reliable, then um, um, we wouldn't actually um, be prescribing a specific uh, form factor or a specific technology. And um, how I see it is that we will let it uh, run alongside the other uh, you know, current uh, forms of or methods for payment. Um, and then we will let the market uh, express their preferences on on which uh, payment method to to use. Uh, that's very uh, progressive for BSP to make the market forces actually be the one to take the lead of what exactly the solution will be. Now, in yeah. terms of cost savings, uh, I understand, and this is something that we could also ask uh, Miles in their implementation that. Uh, BSP in itself spends so much money in terms of printing notes, printing coins, and uh, having a digital type of currency supposedly should be able to uh, provide cost savings in, uh, in printing or minting coins. Do you think we would get into that sort of stage where possibly CBDC could first replace the minting of coins and later on the paper notes, is that something that you could see in the very near future, Deputy Governor? Well, yes, Joey, I, I wouldn't say that is impossible. Uh, but what, because what we're seeing, even with the digital payments alone, um, you know, Joey, it's, it's beginning to, uh, we're, we're beginning to see the impact of the growth of digital payments in the Philippines on the demand for currency. Uh, we we um, um, of course uh, given uh, current uh, given our GDP growth, uh, and then you add that uh, to that the the uh, current high inflation uh, environment, and then so you would really see uh, an increase in in demand for uh, currency. So, but while the the currency is um, uh, the demand is uh, increasing, we see that the rate of growth um, is not as it used to be. So, and when we look at the variables, then we can see that uh, um, some are coming uh, from the impact of uh, the growth of digital, digital payments in the Philippines. So in a way, it's so, affecting uh, the printing or additional yeah. printing of notes or money and could Correct. translate to uh, savings uh, somehow, right, for BSP. Yeah. And, right. and as, uh, you know, one of the things that they, people talk about cashless society, do you think we would ever get into that, even through a CBDC or any types of technology that will be implemented on a digital space? Do you think we will ever, ever really reach a cashless economy? Um. In our lifetime, um, well, I wouldn't say it's it's impossible. Uh, it's it's uh, you know, given the innovation cycles that we are seeing nowadays, uh, the 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 cycles are are becoming shorter and shorter. Um, but that said, uh, if if you look at the current environment, even advanced economies who are way ahead of digital payments uh, still see the need for or cash, uh, there will be um, uh, segments of the population that will uh, choose cash um, yeah, to the point that uh, in, in other 
um, uh, countries are way ahead of digital payments, the the legislators had to legislate the law requiring merchants to accept cash because otherwise, you know, <laughs> merchants um, are tending to exclude uh, cash as a form of uh, a payment. But yes, Joey, as I've mentioned earlier, as long as there are people who prefer one uh, form factor or one uh, uh, payment method uh, over another, then we, we as central bank uh, will, will have to uh, support and include them in the, in the financial and economic life of the country. That's very good. Thank you very much, Deputy Governor. I would like now to go to uh, Miles and say, what do you think are the benefits that you are already uh, reaping off on the, your Jamaican implementation in relation to what the Deputy Governor is saying about a safe, efficient, resilient, reliable uh, uh, technology to be able to address the yeah the distribution of currency so to speak how how do you think uh, right. these benefits now uh, your implementation in Jamaica right now the implementation the national rollout started now so I would say it's a bit too early to say that we have we have like figures or exact figures measurements of the benefits but we do see that the benefit is coming now you know that in um, Jamaica, this is a, the bank penetration is about 70%, but the cash usage is still very high, right? Large percentage of transaction is still being uh, transacted in cash. So with the CBDC launched, right, and uh, the bank and non-financial, non-bank financial institution offering CBDC wallets to both bank and non-bank uh, users, that means people who do not have bank account can actually now participate in digital economy. They can now use their CBDC wallets to buy and sell right, uh, supplies that they need for their businesses, for their farms, right? Um, the government is also the, uh, are planning and working on to issue the, uh, some of their social benefits through the CBDCs towards the end of this year. So people who need the money can now get the money more quickly and they can use the money in the increasing number of acceptance merchants. Um, so that really helped them to improve the quality of life and also improve their productivity. That's a very um, immediate benefit we can anticipate. Also, we talk about the cost of cash. Now, um, some statistics, some analysis show that, right? The cost of cash in total, right, over not just the cost of producing uh, and handling cash for central, but, but to the entire society, because commercial bank has to handle, spend lots of resources in securing and handling cash, and so do the merchants and individuals. Right, that total cost can amount to two to three percent of GDP for countries. Now, over time, as the demand shift from physical cash to digital cash we can anticipate this cost of cash will be reduced. And that will not only benefit the central bank, but benefit that society as a whole, especially right, commercial banks right now is spending resources and uh, to manage, uh, provide cash and distribute cash and recycle cash. The question whether cash will disappear or become a cashless society, I would say it will become a less, less digital cash, uh, sorry, less physical cash but still but shifting towards digital cash. As our lives shift to the digital world, right? You talk about metaverse, right? Um, um, more and more our activity will be spent in the digital economy or the digital twins. We need to want to make sure that people can still have access to central bank money in the future world. And I think that was one of the uh, motivation uh, in more advanced economy, like in Sweden, right? Their cash usage is very, very low. Right? It's very difficult to find ATM to dispense cash and very few merchants will accept yeah. cash now. So the central bank is out actually looking into CBDC to make sure that people will not be cut off from central bank money, right? 
even when they shift towards more electronic activities or digital activities. So I think this is this is the uh, this is the trend. Um, um, but of course, some economy may not be at that stage yet, right? They're more really concerning how CBDC can enable greater financial inclusion or digital inclusion, like right? more digital financial services can be built on CBDC as the last mile. Uh, microfinance, microinsurance, micro saving. These are products, right? that needs the way a way to distribute to the people who do not have bank accounts. But how do we distribute them electronically? Um, so I think CBDC paved an important rail, create an important rail that will enable that kind of digital transformation for countries, right? To lift flock from today's um, a more physical economy into the digital future. So Miles, you mentioned about uh, tapping the unbanked segment through this uh, digital form of currency. So Deputy Governor, I understand that's one of the challenges in the Philippines is to be able to increase uh, people with bank accounts. And I understand we're somewhere between 25-30% if that is actually correct. Do you think this type of implementation is something, as uh, Miles mentioned, leapfrog from a uh, small uh, bank segment to uh, actually a uh, addressing the unbanked segment and making more bank uh, bank accounts out of this segment. Do you think that will that is something that you could uh, that BSP could actually take a look at and benefit from this CBDC implementation later on? Yeah. So, um, well, if if it's going to be an account. Uh, there are uh, anti-money laundering regulations that require uh, know your customer or or KYC. So um, that's why if it's if it's um, digital payments as we use them now, which requires a store of value an account um, or a CBDC that will require an account, uh, it means that that there would have to be a, a KYC undertaken on on the on the customer. So um, in in that way, in that sense, I don't see any uh, a difference. Um, what, right now, what the Philippines is doing is, uh, of course, uh, making uh, KYC uh, more efficient and uh, less cost by implementing a national digital ID program. So if, if um, uh, it, it brings the account ownership closer to, to uh, the people. And um, uh, Joey, we, we, we uh, achieved a lot of progress in the last two years. Uh, we, were, we ended 2019 with about 29% uh, account ownership. Mm -hmm. uh, 2021 were like 56 percent. So it has uh, it has uh, grown so much in in two years. Never before has this happened. Um, and uh, when we look at it, uh, bank account ownership uh, grew almost doubled. But uh, really, the electronic money account is the one that led the charge at uh, more than four times what it was two years ago. So. Um, um again uh, for for the purpose of uh, financial inclusion um in 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 a in a in jurisdictions where you have a mature digital payments in place um then there's uh, got to be other other benefits or more benefits that CBDCs uh uh, need to offer, but I, I agree with Miles. I mean, for for jurisdictions that um, um, do not have these yet, uh, a mature digital payment system, uh, then uh, I believe uh, retail CBDCs can uh, offer a lot of uh, societal benefits. Correct. So, what actually is happening, especially like in the Philippines, since the as you mentioned, the digital payments is already reaching its mature stage and there are just so many players, but actually they contributed to uh, having 
you know, increased uh, bank account holders and so on. There's got to be probably a niche on CBDC, as you mentioned, maybe just on wholesale. And then let's see how it can trickle down into the retail level, knowing for a fact that there are already so many players, digital payment providers uh, in, in the Philippines. Y you think that scenario will be a, a realistic uh, setting uh, as far as CBDC is concerned? I, I think that's a um, very realistic expectation, Joey. Uh, you see, the, um, the reason why we uh, are piloting this uh, CBDC is because um, we really want to uh, understand the first of all the the, the currency life life cycle for CBDCs. We need to be very clear on how it is. Um, uh, issued, how it is uh, distributed, how it is uh, all the way up to how it is retired. Um, so we need to understand that. And not only us, we, the, the supervised institutions, the participants in the payment system also need to have that same understanding uh, in order for you know, um, uh, the, uh, all the supply side actors to uh, be able to perform uh, their their roles. So um, really, we thought that those were compelling reasons for us to to deepen our learning on uh, CBDC by actually uh, using it. Uh, we divided our our project into two phases. The first phase is to use um, uh, what you would call the dummy uh, money. Mm -hmm. um, um, moving on to the second phase where we will be using, uh, uh, you know, actual value. That's very good. And uh, when, when is the reckoning point, uh, Deputy Governor, of this pilot? Is it a one-year one uh, time span before you could actually uh, look at the benefits, the upside? of uh, CBDC on the wholesale level. How, how, how do you see this playing out? Uh, yeah, we, we, uh, the current plan is for the pilot to run until the end of next year, uh, Joey. And then we will have uh, uh, up to six months of assessment um, by the central bank and also together with the pilot participants uh, uh, to see if um, it can indeed uh, offer the benefits that we were hoping it would. That's very good. So hopefully in a year's time, we'll get back to you, Deputy Governor. And it would be uh, very interesting to find out the learnings that you have uh, gone through uh, with this pilot. That's something that uh, definitely we look forward to uh, speaking with you again and sharing with us uh, those learnings. Thank you. Yeah, I look and forward to that too, Joey. Yes, thank you. And Miles, uh, so what were the learnings now that you have seen in Jamaica? And I understand you have another jurisdiction that is very interested somewhere in Africa. Uh, are, are those uh, learnings very much uh, akin to what the deputy governor said in, uh, in the Philippines? Or there are some uh, hidden nuggets that you have seen uh, when you were implementing this in Jamaica? Um. I think the key, um, what my, my, my key learning from the implementation in Jamaica is really communication, public communication, public education is important. Um, the concept of CBDC is a bit hard for the general public to grasp, right? Um, they may not be able to tell the differences between the subtleties right, between electronic payments versus CBDC. So I think education is important, one. Second is also really focus on making CBDC uh, connectable or accepted right, through the existing rails. For adoptions, I mean, I'm talking about more on the retail side, right? You need to be able to have uh, CBDC can be uh, assessed and accepted right, in many places. So in deploying, you need to work with the existing ecosystem, right? So that their existing payment terminals, like point of sale terminals, uh, kiosks, uh, branches, and agents can all 
easily plug into the CBDC infrastructure, right? Um, so that now people can convert between CBDC and physical cash or convert CBDC between bank deposit very easily and in many places and use them. So I think this is important. And, and, and I'm glad that um, this Bank of Jamaica project is really focusing a lot of, uh, is able to focus a lot of the energy on these aspects. Right. That's good. And uh, you mentioned also, also the, including a deputy governor, that education is going to be uh, key here. How are you going to uh, market this down to the level where people will really accept this as something that is already sponsored by the monetary authority, such as the central bank? How, how do you actually bring it down to the masses? Because I understand, uh, right, the deputy governor, it took us about more than 20 years to be able to get real acceptance of digital payments. What more is CBDC? Because it's actually money itself in digital form, right? So, Miles, how are you going to bring it down and what sort of marketing efforts or educational uh, initiatives are you going to have together with the government for people to have real trust and uh, acceptability on this CBDC? What, what, what sort of uh, plans are you now looking at? So you will, as you mentioned, leapfrog this and make sure that Jamaica's um, currency will be, I don't know, 50% CBDC in the next X number of years. How do you intend to do that? Sorry. How do you intend That's to do that? The, the question for me. Make a, I yeah, see. Get that in. Well, I think it's, um, it's a multifaceted effort. One is to work with the private sector, right? Um, There's a very large committee that already all this infrastructure are actually in place, right? The, the, the industry has spent years by right, putting these last miles in place. So one is to utilize it, right? And work with the uh, private sector to promote uh, CBTC usage, right? To educate the public. And also work with them to really put some incentive, right? We are at the end, consumers are motivated by like the tangible benefits. It's more easy to use, less costly to use. Maybe there's some... Um, incentive program in place, uh, reward program to stimulate, right? To create a habit. Once the habit is built, then people will keep coming back. They realize, oh, actually, it is a better option. Or oh, there, there is another option, and this option is a better option in these six scenarios. To really do so, this multi multi facet effort, right? To create that uh, network effect of CBDC. Yeah, because it will really take time, as we know, even digital payments. Uh, only really took off, right, Deputy Governor, during the time of COVID. And I understand that not uh, only in the Philippines, but in many jurisdictions, that the, the COVID uh, scenario was actually some sort of the catalyst to actually, um, you know, make people or force people to actually use digital payments. Do you think uh, without COVID the second or something, Deputy Governor, do you think uh, we have to go through that to be able to get uh, a wider implementation of digital payments or let alone CBDC? What needs to be ha what needs to happen uh, externally for people to really accept? Because as we know, it's a, it's a slow movement of acceptability because at the end of the day, it's currency. But do you think... Uh, we, we need to have another 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 scenario like that, or is that beginning to now get into the lifestyle of uh, people like in the Philippines? Uh, yeah, Joey, I wanted to uh, to uh, uh, chime in earlier. Um, yeah, you're right. Uh, we we launched the uh, uh, digital payments under the National Retail Payment System Framework way back in 2017. And we have seen uh, steady uh, growth. And um, I think we were, we were attracting the, you know, the innovators and uh, even, the, even the early adopters. Uh, but you're right, uh, uh, a shock like uh, a pandemic uh, really 
forced behavioral change. And well, people didn't have a choice. There were, at least in the Philippines, we had mobility restrictions. And, and how else could you access um, um, goods and services uh, other than uh, doing it o- online and paying for them online? So uh, yes, Joey, we experienced a rapid growth in the adoption of digital payments in, uh, during the pandemic years. But what's, what's uh, interesting, uh, Joey, because um, you know when we, when our economy started reopening late uh, 2021 and uh, of course uh, 2022, um, my concern was that uh, the, the, the uh, uh, people would go back to, to cash as they are able to leave their homes and do the transactions physically. Uh, but um, to my, well, I was pleasantly surprised that uh, people continued, there was stickiness, people continued to use digital payments. And there was a recent survey done by uh, the, the economy uh, report uh, that says that in the case of the Philippines, um, over 99%, if I, if I recall the number correctly, it was a high 90, 90s uh, number, um, said, uh, responded in the survey that uh, uh, they'll, they'll continue uh, with, the, um, with the use of digital payments even with the uh, economy re- reopening. So another, another sign of that, Joey, is that you know, uh, people are now opening accounts more because they want to be able to perform and participate in digital payments. Uh, whereas before, before uh, 2021, the, the primary reason people opened accounts was to save. Uh, now the, the need for uh, digital payments overtook that. And it's now the dominant, now the dominant uh, purpose uh, in the Philippines to, to open accounts. But of course, too, we, we would like people to also... Um, through digital payments, uh, save more. That's good. Thank you. Uh, we would like to entertain uh, a few uh, questions here, and uh, any of you could actually uh, uh, answer this. We only have a few minutes left. Uh, one question here is: uh, uh, How could you discuss interoperability between different countries, especially on CBDC? And another one is, what does blockchain technology do uh, in terms of uh, looking at privacy, in terms of looking at uh, fiat uh, as, a, as an entity of central bank? Uh, Deputy Governor Miles, uh, please uh, feel free to uh, chime in. Okay, uh, I'll um, take your first cut. Um, on the first question, interoperability between CBDs of different countries, my, okay, there are different layers to this interoperability. And the lowest layer, the technology, right? But I think the more difficult part is the governance, the sovereignty of the CBDC. So each country, right, has their own right to issue um, CBDC, and they will only recognize their own currency, the right? currency issued by them. So the even even we all the whole world or different, or different countries are issuing CBDC on the same technology. You will still need to have a mechanism to exchange CBDC. Um, it's through a essentially a foreign exchange mechanism. Um, well, having the CBs on the same technology but may make it easier, but it is not the most critical part. I would say that is the uh, agreement and arrangement, um, the recognition of the foreign uh, currency as the key part to make the different countries' CBDC into operable. And um, maybe, David Govern, you you would like to add something to this? Um, well, 
so the the, the question uh, miles is uh, um, how the, about interoperability right um how to make this interoperable um right now uh, joey at, at least when it comes to wholesale uh there uh, are uh, entities and swift is one of them that that uh, has come out and say that they could offer uh um an exchange of uh, cbdc from one jurisdiction to another so it's like they could they could perform uh that role of uh, enabling uh interoperability for uh cbdc so um well wow, that 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 could be very useful when when uh, the world goes into using cbdc's for cross border settlements if other uh uh settlement arrangements uh, do, do not do not come out all right uh looks like we are out of time um i think um we're out of time but so thank you very much um joey for inviting me and the deputy governor to this session and thank you deputy governor for sharing your insight with us <laughs>